Hello, Authentic Life Church. How are you today? Hopefully you're as excited as I am. I actually was sitting here during, uh, or standing during the worship time, just going, man, I feel like it's been a long time since church, and, and uh, it's just exciting to be able to start off our week this way, and hopefully you feel the same way. So I'm Pastor Bruce, lead pastor here at Authentic Life Church. If this is your first time, we're so thankful that you're here. For the rest of you, we are just so blessed that we can be a church no matter where we are at. Uh, God set it up that way. He dwells within us, so it's awesome. Hey, grab a Bible or a device and turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Um, we're going to be looking at a section of Scripture where Jesus does a healing, and we're going to look at our lives. And we are in the last two weeks of our series called Messy, uh, with purpose hides in the chaos, and being able to find where God can do great things even in the messy things of life. And so we have two more weeks for this week and next week uh, to finish up this series. Hey, I wanted to give a shout out to the generosity of our church. Um, you know, honestly, I just keep getting blown away. It seems like every day there's more and more stacks of, of canned goods and, and cereal and things for the food bank. And an interesting thing happened on um, Tuesday, I believe, was a man came over and he, he, he's in a neighborhood, doesn't go to our church, but he just knew we had a food bank. And so he, he actually knocked on our door and he, he asked this question. He goes, uh, I just need to do something. I just need to do something. And he goes, can I bring food by like every week? Can I bring food for your food bank? And Pastor Danny's like, yes, you can do that. And we gave him a rundown of, of our church and what we were able to do and how we feed Hundreds of families every single week. And so uh, I don't know if that, that gentleman's watching today, but thank you so much. But thank you to everybody who's doing that. Um, you know, here, here's one of the things that we founded uh, Authentic Life on. When we started this out, when Danny, Debbie, and myself and our spouses all sat down and go, hey, we want to build a church, we want to do it on proper foundations. One of our cores is generosity or give. And so we, we have this philosophy. We are unapologetically generous, which means that we want to be generous to our staff. We want to be generous to the people in the church. We want to be generous to our community, and we want to be generous to the world, no matter what, because God's that way. And we just know that, that we're supposed to be a conduit or a funnel almost that he pours into us, and we go out to everybody else. And so we see that from the very beginning, and it's lived out, again, unapologetically. So when people go, how come you're doing this stuff? How can you feed, uh, you know, send thousands of dollars over to India to, to feed those people? when we're in the middle of the pandemic here. And it's like, well, that's just what we do. We're called to be generous and we live it out. And we've just seen, I mean, we, we were founded on generosity. In essence, Church for All Nations could pretty much almost, you know, let us just come right in this building. We just got all kinds of people. It's just been awesome. But I want to show you another thing of generosity is that uh, I told you last week, we have a ministry in Ecuador, and we have Chris and Tina Ferry, who are missionaries out there, and they are pastors to the pastors, so what they do is all the, the native uh, pastors that are in all the villages in Ecuador, these are Indian cultures, and, and some of them are very, they still carry spears and do stuff like that, but they pastor the pastors, and, and they also have had shutdowns, and people are running out of food, and so Chris and Tina Ferry and us have partnered together to be able to feed those people, and so Chris and Tina sent us a little quick video, and I just wanted you to see it, and uh, just a shout out to Authentic Life Church. Hello, Authentic Life Church. We want to thank you for your guys' support during this crazy time. Um, during this time, we've been able to come alongside pastors and local churches, and we've been able to put funds in their hands so that they've been able to buy food kits to give to families in extreme need. Our normal all about empowering the local church and helping them raise up to fulfill their role and their responsibility in reaching the lost and discipling the reached. So this is right in line with that vision that we have for raising up the local church. It's been so much fun to be able to, over the last two months, distribute more than $3,000 put that money right into the hands of the pastors and the Christian leaders and multiply the impact as people are learning to look to the Lord and look to the local church for hope in this season. Thank you so much, ALC, for coming alongside us so that we can come alongside the Ecuadorian church. Yes, thank you. 
Hello, I'm going to authentic tell you white. another one uh, that we're going to do next week. So everybody write this on your calendar. Next week is Memorial Day weekend, believe it or not. And we realize that a lot of people, their plans and uh, whatever they want to do, camping and things, uh, have been thwarted. And so we, we came up with an idea, actually Pastor Mitch did, on uh, doing uh, pizza and prayer or prayer and pizza, however you want to say it. And so what we're going to do is we're actually uh, partnering with Papa Murphy's uh, Pizza and uh, we're going to get just tons of pizzas and we are asking you between the hour of 12 and 1 uh, next Sunday to come drive by and we're going to have a bunch of prayer warriors to pray over you. And you might sit down and go, well, I don't have a specific prayer need. You don't need to, but don't you still want a prayer blessing? So we're going to do prayer and pizza. And you, you can sit down and say, I don't need a pizza. Well, then give it away. Again, generosity breeds generosity. We just want to see your face. We want to love you. We want to just get together somehow. So we actually thought this was a good idea. So Sunday after the second service at 12 o'clock uh, until we run out of pizzas or, or run out of people, uh, we're going to have that go on. So basically 12 to 1 is our, is our goal. So we have lots of people are going to be praying right out here in our parking lot. There's going to be a big runway. We're going to have cones and stuff. And uh, we'll do some social distancing. But however you want, we want to pray over you. Pray for your family. Pray for health. Pray for wisdom. Just pray for blessing. And at the same time, you get your lunch and you get pizza you can take home or give away to somebody else. Okay. Our series is messy. When, when purpose hides in the chaos, today is ever get sick of it. And uh, so why don't we begin this time in prayer? So bow your heads with me if you could. Ah, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for drawing us here, wherever here is at. We know there's people all over the place, and we thank you for the footprint, the, the, the ability to bless people and to be blessed by each other. Thank you for the, 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 these these you know, wonderful hearts of generosity that are all around us. We thank you for the giving. We thank you for the blessing. We thank you for the shout outs. We thank you for uh, just the way that you love to touch our lives. And so, Lord, as we read your word, as we talk about sin, as we talk about these areas that are such a struggle in our lives, Lord, I pray that people would walk away today with victory, that, that we would all be different uh, just in the next hour. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, talk about messy. It's been a messy time, uh, right? It's just not been normal. I'm getting sick of it. Uh, I'm tired of this stuff. I hear over and over, man, can we just get back together? And I'll share that in just a minute. But I thought I found some funny things that were uh, people are trying to actually uh, be able to uh, do their mask. You know how we're supposed to make our own mask or wear a mask when we go shopping. And so I ran across this. Now, I realize that maybe there's not... And not everybody finds humor in what's going on around us, but I can't help it. And so I wanted to show you a couple of things. So these are some makeshift masks. So here's one. This is a lady. <laughs> Sorry. This is a lady who, who uh, I don't know, put it back. I mean, she's probably going to die of asphyxiation instead of, instead of uh, does she have a breathing hole in that? I don't know. But anyways, so here's the next one. Somebody's doing this. I put it back. I can't tell if they're going to a football game or if they're actually, uh, um, you know, trying to make sure that they're okay. What's the next one? Let's see. This guy uh, said, uh, you know, I can't find a mask, so I'll just put a bottle of water on my head. And, and plastic, plastic works, right? That's on my shield. <laughs> and, and this next one is my favorite. Uh, right. I, I'm thinking to myself, do I want the virus, or do I want to have a effect of mold? She put the worst thing you possibly can have on your face as a sponge, the dirtiest, most grossest thing. <laughs> I can't believe that. Okay, what's the next one? Um, this this person, I don't know. Are they going shopping, or are they trying to get a part on Star Wars? I I, I don't I don't really know. And then our last one is uh, an individual who decided I'm going to make my own air, and I'm going to be completely covered in everything. So maybe they're on their trip. Maybe they're going to go snorkeling in just a little bit. I I really scuba diving. I don't know. But, uh, uh, so I don't know what you've done. I, my mother-in-law made me a nice mask, which was pretty awesome. But uh, I thought I'd share some of those, those funnies of some people taking it maybe just a little, a little too far, a little too crazy. Hey, uh, but all seriousness, uh, people are asking when we're going to open up. We, we, we really don't have an official date. I, I get on the phone uh, every other week with Governor Polis. Uh, he meets with pastors. So there's about 700 of us on a call last uh, Tuesday and it looks like maybe 
pretty much the first or second week of June. Uh, we're going to be able to do that. We already have all the chairs, uh, and uh, we have rows, but they're, they're six feet apart, like they're every other row, so that we can make sure we have the distancing and make sure you feel good. Um, but our hope is, is that early in June, we're going to be able to all meet together. Now, we realize not everybody's going to meet together. In fact, I had a phone call this week. I was asking me, you know, are we still going to be able to do online streaming during this time? Absolutely. In fact, that's our new normal. We're going to be do, doing online streaming. So if you don't feel comfortable coming in, that's up to you. That'll be fine. Uh, stay at home. But if you do want to come with everybody, we're going to make sure we have everything sanitized, that in between services, that we're, we're hosing down all the seats. Not hosing, not like they're going to be wet, but, you know, uh, whatever that called, fumigate or debug, whatever we're going to do. Uh, I don't know all those technical terms. <laughs> Me and Donald Trump, we just kind of make things up as we go here and there. But anyways, those pictures uh, were unpleasant enough. Well, what we're going to talk about is some unpleasant things. We're actually going to talk about sicknesses. And today is, do you ever get sick of it? Um, When I get sick... I just know that I want to do whatever I can to feel better. If I have aches and pains, I'm shoving. I'm like drinking bottles of pills and downing all that stuff. I'm taking vitamins all the time. Anything that's a pain reliever, you know, if I'm just really all achy and, you know, my wife comes in. She goes, what are you doing as I'm guzzling down something? She goes, I go, well, it says it relieves all pain. She goes, well, you can't drink and and can't swallow Ben Gay. And and, and I know, but but if it says it relieves pain, I'm going to take anything like that. And it seems to be the way we are when we're sick. You know, we just want to do whatever we can to get well. But this doesn't seem to be true when it comes to the greatest sickness that's in our life, and that is our sin. See, we have a thing called a sin nature, and we each have sin patterns. In other words, your pattern might be anger, or your pattern might be lust, your, your pattern might be uh, d- depression or defeatism or, or negativity or, or, or bitterness or gossip or, or, or some type of addiction. And, and we each have these different areas that we struggle in. And it seems that unlike when it comes to a sickness like the flu, it, let's just take the flu. If you had the flu, you would never, like as you're so cold and you have the shivers, you would never run out outside into a snowstorm and start making snow angels, you know, you wouldn't be doing that in your underwear and just kind of go, I'm going to hang out here in the snow for a couple hours. You wouldn't do that because that's crazy. Instead, if you had the flu, you would crawl underneath the covers and you would drink some hot soup or eat some ice cream or say, honey, bring me my teddy bear. You know, I just need something to snuggle, you know, whatever. That's what we do. We try to take care of ourselves and our sickness. But for some reason, when it comes to our sin patterns, we have an opposite effect. We actually are drawn to them, and we actually feed them and actually do things that make it worse in our lives. It's almost like in our sin, we go out there and we make little snow devils and, and, and do whatever that is and, and try to feed into that. And yet we have the great antidote, which is Jesus Christ. We have the great physician, God, who sits down and he says this. He says to us, He says, listen, you know, read my word and you will be nourished and made well. Or or he sits down and he tells us, follow my prescriptions and my laws and it will go well with you. You know, get empowered by me and my Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit can dwell within you. And then everything will be, make sense as you go along. Trust in me and you'll be safe and warm. But what do we do? We do the opposite. We don't read his word. Instead, we read everything else. We don't follow his laws and his, his prescriptions. Instead, we sit down and we follow our self-made laws or, or we'd rather rely on government or these other things instead of God and his word. Instead of allowing him to live in and through us, we, we get self-dependence. Does this make any sense? Do you ever get sick of it. You know, this thing, sin, this, if we can call it a, d- a disease, it's not really, but if for the sake of this illustration or what's going on, this disease, sin, can ravish us and take us over. And yet, instead of doing the things that fight it, instead of doing the things that suppress it, we have a tendency to cause more issues in our life. Well, we're going to look at Jesus uh, uh, doing a healing in Matthew chapter 8, if you're there. Matthew chapter 8, and we're going to start with verse 1 uh, through 4. And Jesus, all the time, he, he uh, went out, and uh, it seems that often he'd be in a, um, you know, going into a group, and crowds would come together, and people wanted healing. And so uh, 
we're mostly going to focus on two through four, but I just thought I might as well read one. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. Verse two, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man. He said, I am willing. He said, be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Now, did you catch this? So this guy has leprosy. Now, let me explain leprosy a little bit. Leprosy is extremely contagious. Uh, in fact, a person would have to come into a room. If you came into a room, let's say you were going to a store, you have to yell out, unclean, unclean. And everybody would back away. I mean, talk about like the virus, the coronavirus that we have now. This is somebody that, unclean. The other thing is it could lay dormant for three to five years. You could have it for three to five years and not even know it. And then, you know, kind of like cancer. People, cancer is starting to eat you inside. And uh, even though it's not contagious, it still kind of happens for that. It could be years before you really understand what's going on inside your body. But with leprosy, you start to see, like, there'd be a little skin patch, dry, and it be get flaky, and maybe you become ashen. And then it begins to get worse and worse. What it does inside of you is it, 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 it kills your nerves. And so people's hand, fingers begin to start to curl, and almost because there's no uh, nerves in there, uh, it starts to die, and so parts of their fingers would just all of a sudden fall off, and, and maybe their nose and ears and things, and, and uh, if you got cut, you got infection, you could put your hand on a fire and not know it because you can't feel anything. So that's why a lot of times you see people with leprosy, if you ever look it up. I was going to show pictures, but I thought our pictures of the people with masks was gross enough for you today, but basically uh, it eats away. And so this person comes up and he goes, if you are willing, and you catch Jesus, he touches the person. He says, I am willing, be cleansed or be free, uh, be healed. And he is. Now when Jesus heals somebody, when he heals a leper, when he heals anybody, you always get in scripture that if they have a withered hand, it became back to normal. If they had withered legs their whole life, they would all of a sudden become back to normal. So we understand something. When Jesus does healings physically, he doesn't just get rid of the, the effects for the future or the present. He doesn't stop the leprosy only. He actually gets rid of its past effects in a person's life. So that which was gone now is back to, to whole. And, and I want you to liken this as we go on with all this uh, to what he does within us in our sin natures. But understand, sin is kind of like this leprosy. I'm, I'm making a connection here. Is that it, it, it isn't something that lays dormant in our life. We have it all the time. We're actually born into that. It's called a sin nature. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's highly contagious in a sense. It's effects. It goes from Adam you know, all the way to the, 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 the next generation, the next generation, where the sins of the fathers are passed down to the kids, and so on and so on. And its effects can be very different uh, for each household, or each culture, or every nation. Uh, let's take incense. In, uh, uh, incense, no. Incest, yeah, incense is a smelling thing. Uh, in, incest is actually something that it can be kept in the family, you know, or maybe anger. You have an angry household, and that's passed on down to the kids, and, and they, they pass it on down to their kids. Or lust issues, or, or, or same addictive behaviors, alcoholism. You know, for the history of my family, at least on one side, it's just alcoholic after alcoholic. And I was right on that same track until Jesus came into my life. You know, so we can have these sin natures and these sin patterns. And so the question is, is it nature or nurture? And I'm going to tell you it's both. It's our nature to be sinners. We are born into sin. So as infants on, we, we are sinners. And yet, but there's also a nurturing that happens. Some people have a higher propensity towards alcoholism. Some people have a higher propensity towards anger or, or other issues in your life. But uh, we also can be nurtured into that. You know, abuse happens on. It can pass on down and pass on down. You know, I know my, in my life, my, uh, my mom and dad divorced when I was a year old. And this is in the early 60s. I mean, that just didn't always happen. And, and I, they divorced when I was a year old, but they got back together when I was six. And my biggest memory of my dad moving home, I love my dad. Uh, he's passed away now, but, but uh, in many ways a wonderful father. But my memory 
of him moving back into our house was boxes and boxes of hardcore pornography. And my parents were, were uh, hippies. And in those days, believe it or not, it was actually encouraged. There was books about allowing your young children to see sexual pictures so that they could learn about sexuality. So my parents thought that this would be normal just to leave me in a room with boxes and boxes of this. The sins of the father are passed on down to the sons in so many ways. And yet, I ask you, as you look at your sin, as you look at whatever your sin pattern is, whatever's been there, you ever get sick of it? You know, there's a sense to where we socially distance ourselves from God. And instead, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our sin, in the midst of these struggles, whatever it is for you, it's not socially distancing from God. It's drawing into that, getting the prescription that is our God. I look at COVID-19, and I think, man, what is it? 1% of death rate, if that, you know, is happening. Well, I'm here to tell you, sin, the disease of sin, is 100% death rate. Jesus, tell, God tells us that uh, the wages of sin is death. In other words, the cause of our sin is complete separation from him, you know, spiritual death. But the good news is Jesus is the antidote. Jesus Christ is our great antidote. Christ came down to take on the punishment that we deserve, and he is that antidote. And so as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can receive Christ, and all of a sudden the consequences of our sin is no longer death, no longer spiritual death, but life in Jesus Christ. But you may be asking yourself right now, well, if Christ has come in and he's conquered my sin, why do I still sin? Why do I still have anger issues? Why can't I get rid of this addiction? Why do I keep perpetually falling into these traps? Well, the Apostle Paul kind of helps us along. There's a great verse. You can turn there if you want to, but Romans chapter 7. Uh, and and it's, a famous, it's a great section of Scripture. Uh, I love it, not because of the sadness of it, but because it reminds me that I need a great healer, Jesus Christ, but it also reminds me that I am, no matter what I do, I can still fall into some traps. And so this is the Apostle Paul, and he says this, starting with verse 14. And it's a long section of Scripture, so, so bear with this, but, but look at these words. Listen to this. Chapter, chapter 7, verse 14 of Romans. We know that the law is spiritual. God, God's word is spiritual. But I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. In other words, I was born into this. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but, but it's a sin that's living within me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, <laughs> that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot seem to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living within me that does it. Now, he's not, he's not um, poo-pooing our sin. He's not excusing it. He's not saying, oh, well, you can't help it. No, no, no. He's just saying that there's this battle, this war that's within us. Let's continue on in verse 21. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I do delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that works within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What a great question. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? I'm born into this disease, this sin pattern, this sin nature. And it's also been nurtured in my life, but it's also part of my nature. And Apostle Paul says there's this battle. The things I want to do, I can't seem to do. The good that I know I should be doing, I don't do. No, the evil I do not want to do, that I keep doing. Anybody else with me? Anybody else see that in Apostle Paul? Why? Oh God, why is this happening to me? I love your word, I love your laws, I love your ways, and yet I still find myself drifting into these wrong areas. Why? Who's going to save me from this wretched body of sin that is within me? You know, he's basically saying, I am sick of it. I'm sick of this. Who's going to save me? 
then he answers this question as we go on. Let's start with verse 24 again. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he gives the answer, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Do I hear an amen? Amen. And then he goes on, so then, I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law. In other words, I've given my life to him. But in my sinful nature, you know, who I was born, this, this, this you know, slave to sin in a sense, is, is I still see the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And then, probably one of the best lines in Scripture, uh, in anywhere in the Bible, is chapter 8, verse 1. And he says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Jesus Christ, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now get what he's saying here. He's saying that in a sense, in the messiness of our sin, that, that eventually it leads us to a place, or should lead us to a place, to where we go, I am sick of my sin. And so I finally get on my knees, and I give my life to Jesus Christ. You know, I know me. I was, I was drinking every single night. I was on drugs consistently. I was a drug addict. I was totally in deb- debauchery. I was in all the way gone. And then I finally got sick of it, and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And he came in. But I find this law at work. That even though he's come in and he's stopped the consequences of my sin, there's no longer spiritual death. I'm now in union with God and heaven is mine. I still find this other law at work that my sin nature and my sin patterns still creep up. That I must find a daily dependence upon him in order to find that freedom. But he says this. is reason what verse uh, 1 of chapter 8 is so important. He says, man, we have this battle. And you might think that you're just a piece of junk. That even though you're a Christian, you keep failing. He says, but this is what the truth is. There is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Even though you might still sin, you're still a sinner. You know, and and, and, and there are consequences to that. But there is no condemnation. You are free, 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 free indeed. Now, I know some people might say, well, then what's to keep us from sinning? We might as well, I guess, I just am forgiven for everything. I can just do whatever I want. No. We learn in chapter 3 of Romans that, that, that uh, it's because of his kindness that leads us to repentance. Because of this great God who saves me, I desire to no longer sin. Because he dwells now within me, I now have the opportunity not to sin. But no matter what, because we're still sinners, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And so if you're watching here today, you're listening, you're, you're sitting in your room, maybe you're by yourself, maybe you're with your family and you haven't given your life to Jesus, you need to do that. The messiness of sin is real. Man, and I'm sick of it. And it draws me to my knees to receive Jesus. But those of us that are Christians, again, our sin should still draw us to our knees in repentance. There should be a place. We should be like the Apostle Paul. Who's going to save me from this wretched body of sin that I am? Thanks be to Jesus Christ who paid the price You know, Paul hits the nail of sin on the head. Bam! Or maybe even better, Jesus hits the head of sin with the nails of the cross. He took on the penalty. This is called a great exchange. We gain his life. He took on the punishment that we deserved. That's a great exchange. So when you receive Jesus, when you ask him into your life... All you're really doing is you're exchanging. He's taking the punishment that you deserve for your sin, and you take on his life of perfection, of good, and wholeness. Am I still going to be a sinner? Yeah, I still still sin. And there's a sense where Apostle Paul says, what are we going to do? I mean, uh, uh, I can't help it. You know, I find this law at work that every time I want to do good, evil is right there. I see that in my life. I, I get sick of myself. But I thank God that there's no condemnation. But as Christians, this doesn't give us an excuse. We need to keep moving forward. We need to fight the good fight. And I want to give you an illustration that I hope sticks with you the rest of your life. There's actually a, a, what, what we'll call the Trojan caterpillar. You can look this up. Trojan caterpillar. It's a Massalenia butterfly, uh, or Macalenia. Maybe it's kind of like the Macarena or something like that. But Macalenia butterfly. 
And the Macalinia butterfly does this, okay? So you know butterflies, they start as caterpillars. So they somehow have their little eggs, and the eggs turn into uh, these caterpillars as larvae. And the Macalinia butterfly larva, this, this Trojan caterpillar, starts out like most caterpillars. It just begins to eat leaves. And so it's hanging on these bushes, and it eats leaves, and it eats them for days. Then, I don't know how it knows, but all of a sudden, out of the blue, it just decides to drop out of the bush or the tree. It just drops to the ground. It just lays there near an ant hill. And as it's laying there, it's just waiting for the ants. And the ants come on over, and, uh, you know, ants will eat caterpillars. Ants will grab anything. They bring it in, and the rest of the ants all eat it, and they, they do all that stuff. But not, not with this Trojan caterpillar. What, what they do is the Trojan caterpillar excretes this, this sweet substance out of its tush. Just kind of... And the ants go nuts. It's like cocaine. It gets them all going. And they're like, oh, this sweet substance. And they start slurping on this, the, 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 the tush of this, this caterpillar. And then it goes and gets so excited, it starts telling all the other ants to, to come on over. They actually pick up the caterpillar. They do, do. They all work their way, and they're going to go, ho, ye, ho. You know, we're taking this to our, our den, and they're all excited. And if the hole can't fit it, they start making it bigger and bigger. They're doing whatever they can to get this caterpillar into their den. And there's something within the substance that actually makes them go out of their minds and actually do the bidding of the caterpillar. And they bring it down, not just into the den, they bring it down where their larva is, where all the baby ants are. And they bring the caterpillar in there as it's excreting this, and they're all going nuts. And then as they bring it down in there, the caterpillar eats the larva. It eats the babies of the ants. And not only that, but the ants end up guarding the caterpillar. They will do anything to protect it as it is eating away their future. Until it finally grows and crawls out of the den and gets a cocoon and becomes a butterfly. That's what this butterfly, that's what this Trojan caterpillar does. Now liken that to our sin. There is a sense to where even though we've been given freedom in Christ, we still can be drawn to our sin. And we bring it down into the den of our lives. And all the while, as we're sucking on the butt of sin, it is eating away at our future. It's destroying our marriages. It's hurting our relationships. It's, it's, it's still, no matter what our sin, it does bring separation between us and God. Not eternal, because there's no condemnation. But it still does something now. And you heard me right when I said that we're sucking on the butt of sin. And I, Gross? Yeah, absolutely. But our sin is Gross. And all the while that we're sucking on the butt of sin, uh, it is eating away at our future. So it, in closing, if, if we were all being able to be here at church today, I would have this be an altar time. I would have the music playing, and people would come forward, and we'd all be kneeling all over the place and bringing your sin before God. What is your sin pattern? What is your, is it some type of addiction? Is it a, is a lust pattern? Is it pornography? Is it, is it uh, anger? What is it that you somehow keep giving excuses? Oh, well, you'd be angry too if you had a husband like mine. Or you'd be, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd be bitter also if, if, this, if your wife did this to you. Or you'd, you, you, you'd, you, of course you'd watch pornography. I mean, it's, it's free. What excuses are you giving that you're sucking on the butt of sin? And that we need to lay that before the Lord. So wherever you're at, uh, maybe you want to kneel. Maybe you just want to bow your head. But pretend that you're on an altar. And remember, Jesus has forgiven you. He loves you dearly. But there is this battle that's waging within us. And we need to fight it. The prescription is, is, is the antidote is Jesus. The prescription is his word, uh, prayer. Constantly going before him daily just thanking him for his forgiveness and if you have never received Jesus I'm going to give you an opportunity today I want to allow you to receive Christ in your life Uh, I guess I don't allow you God allows you but I want you to have that opportunity so if whatever your altar is whether it's in your room whether it's next to your fireplace whether it's on your couch why don't you just kneel before the Lord uh, right now and 
and get ready to, to pray about this and lean. To pick something that you need to give. And I'm going to open this up, and then I'm going to give you some time to talk to him on your own. Jesus, I thank you so much that you've conquered sin through Jesus Christ. You, you, you hit the nail of sin on the head, or even better yet, the head of sin has been nailed to the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Thank you for taking my sin, knowing it, and all of its past effects and future and present have been conquered. Thank you that there's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. We thank you for that. But right now, we want to just talk to you about our sin. So take this moment right now. Just talk to him. Say, forgive me, Father, for my sins. Forgive me. Give me strength. Lord, thank you so much for your forgiveness. And now for those of you that you have not received Jesus yet and you want an opportunity, let me just tell you how simple it is. This is clearly in Scripture. All you need to do is believe. You just need to believe and receive that which God has already done, the great exchange. He took on your punishment that you deserve, but you take on his life. And so if you'd like to ask Christ in your life, just, just repeat these words after me. Jesus, come into my life. I ask you as my Lord and Savior. I thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. I now accept the life you give. And I understand that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. I receive you now. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen.